Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I'm going to be walking you through how I drew this picture of a purple crocus. Now, if you've been watching my pastel videos of late, you will have seen footage of this before, but I haven't shown all of it together and I wanted to walk you through it because I liked it and felt like it. I don't know. I'm feeling wild and rebellious. So anyways, <laughs> I uh, started out by sketching this flower and I will show you what the flower looks like, uh, my reference photo. So here is the picture I'm going to be referencing as I create this picture. Now I am choosing to focus just on the flower in focus, none of the blurred out ones and none of the background. That's because this paper is kind of small and I started doing that on another page and it was just a mess and it just didn't work out with the layout and the size of this paper. So I sw switch gears and I am just choosing to focus on this one picture and do as much detail as I can. I wanted it to be kind of a simple picture and so I decided not to do any background other than just a dark blue uh, gradient um, because I wanted to see how well these pencils blended out in, uh, and how even you could get them, all that kind of stuff. So there is rhyme to my madness and reason to it. But once I sketched out the basic shapes of this flower and I wasn't overly careful with it because flowers can be a little bit different and they don't have to be as exact as like a portrait. So I just roughly sketched it out and then I'm color blocking right now. I'm looking at where some of those shadows are showing up through the petals and I am sh um, blocking where the highlights are, where the variations of purple, just really trying to rough it in so that I don't lose the shapes that I um, sketched out and so I don't lose my place. I'm also trying to get a layer of pastel down so that this will blend better. The paper I'm working on is pastel matte paper and it tends to grip the pastel really well and doesn't blend a ton unless there's enough pastel pigment to kind of roll around almost like a bearing and then it has more room there's more of it so it can blend and smudge a little bit better. So I'm just getting this base layer in and then I'm blocking in the background just so I can start finalizing kind of the general shapes I'm going to be using and not be distracted by my sketch lines, all of that. So I'm just kind of blocking it in. I, if I was going to do this again, I would do an underpainting. Um, I could do it with watercolor, or I could do it with the pastels like this and then blend it out with either rubbing alcohol or water to, because I'm working on a plain white paper and one of the biggest struggles I had with this picture was trying to cover the white of the paper. And if I would have just done some kind of underpainting, it would have been so much easier to get a soft blend that wasn't fighting with the white of the paper. I wouldn't have any streakiness from pencils because that's one of the hard things with colored pencil or pastel pencils is they don't they're not as wide as a traditional soft pastel so when you're working with a traditional soft pastel you can lay it on its side and cover a lot of area quickly and evenly and with pastel pencils you trade that for the ability to sharpen it and get a lot of detail so pros and cons of each that's why i usually work with them together instead of just using one or the other but with this being for a review and trying to understand the material and the supplies and things like that so I could give it a fair judgment and review, not judgment. I'm not sending anyone to jail. Even if it's an art supply, that's not very good. No art prison here. But, <laughs> but to give it a fair review, I wanted to uh, make sure I was giving it a fair chance on its own to see how well it worked before I started using it with other supplies because other supplies can kind of hide mistakes and flaws in the supply and now I'm rambling but anyways I did a rough blue and kind of teal background and then I came back to the flower and I'm just layering it up again 
In these early stages, I'm not worrying too much about how sharpened the pencil is. These were new, so they all started off pretty sharp, but I'm not too much of a stickler on having a super sharp pastel pencil until I'm trying to get really fine details and sharp lines. But in these early stages, I'm just trying to lay down color and blend it so that I could have a base to work from. And this back and forth um, layering and blending is what I do for a lot of this piece. Now, one thing to keep in mind that I probably would do different as well is I don't think I would have used the soft tool for as long as I do in this picture. You'll see later on, I'll get colors really dark and then I'll blend it out with the soft tool and it just picks up too much of the pigment. The pastel pencils don't lay enough down to really counteract how much those soft tools can pick up. And so I end up doing a lot of back and forth and like retreading the same ground over and over again. Um, I had just started back in art after taking the summer off and just wasn't really thinking fully about all the supplies I had. And I was kind of lazy and I didn't want to go dig out some of my other blending tools that I have, even though it would have made this a lot easier and faster. So I'm just building up those layers and you can see right here with the soft tool, it blended it out and it made it incredibly a soft blend, but it also lightened it up and I lost a lot of that dark value that I had laid down before. So something to keep in mind, another reminder of why underpaintings are fantastic. And an underpainting on this paper does work. This is pastel matte paper. And the sketchbook I'm working in is one that I made myself. Um, and there's glassine sheets in between each page, so it doesn't smear. But um, this can do an underpainting. I probably would have done like a rubbing alcohol one just because it dries so quick. And I don't have to worry about it getting the papers underneath it wet. So I am looking at my reference photo as I'm working so I can kind of see where those highlights and those shadows are. And that's what's really nice about having a reference photo to work from, even if you end up changing quite a bit about it. Because this flower was backlit to some degree. So you could see the shadows from the petals that we can't really see much of. You can see the shadows through the petals in the front. That's what all these like dark blue areas are. Those are the pad the shadow of the petals kind of showing through these front petals. And, and so having this reference photo, I could really look at the shapes and the form of it and how the light was interacting because it can be really tricky, especially if you're new to art, knowing how the light is going to respond to different shapes and how lighting affects how things look, especially something like this where it's not 100% opaque. So you're gonna have some translucency within it. And I'm still just looking at kind of the basic shapes. And my flower is shaped just a little bit different than this one in my reference photo because I just quickly sketched it out. But I'm just looking at the basic shapes of the shadows and the highlights and things like that and continuing to block them in. It's still too early in the picture to really start focusing on detail. And if you are like early on in your picture, just focus on the shapes. Don't start doing fine details. If you're doing a face, don't start doing the eyelashes this early on. You want to save those fine details, those finishing touches at, till the very end because there's nothing more frustrating to, to get something perfect, but then all the stuff around it, finding out it all has to be adjusted and having to undo, erase, cover up all the work that you had just done. So just keep it loose just look at the, the big picture of it all. And then as you work, you'll gradually refine it down and start looking into smaller and smaller areas of the picture until you get it to a way you like it. I didn't have a super bright magenta color like that 
almost barney purpley pink color that you see in the crocus um that's not what color crocuses usually are but it's the lighting that's making it look like that and I didn't have like that exact color or something that was super close to it so to create that kind of glowing purple effect I had to layer a lot of pinks with my purples to achieve it and then I switched to using a different tool called a rubber shaper or a clay shaper it's a shaped tool that's made out of silicone at, silicone at the end and it's kind of rubbery in texture and what that does is it kind of pushes down and smudges what you've done and softens the edges of it but you don't get really big soft blends like you do with the soft tool but it also doesn't pick up too much pigment and I have a big one that's kind of like it called a catalyst and it looks like this big gray spatula thing that you hold with your hand and if you've seen my other videos I use that quite a bit because it does something similar just in a bigger area once I got that layer done then I start working on the background some more starting to darken it up I didn't have a huge plan for how I wanted this background to look um, I just knew I wanted to change it a little bit from what the reference photo looked like so I just knew I wanted it to be blue I just like blue so that's why I chose it um, but I kind of go back and forth how I design it now the stuff I was spraying on that was Krylon uh, a fixative it's a workable fixative so you can spray it on let it dry and then come back and work on top of it and it will keep it will add a little bit of texture to your paper so you don't ever lose it so if you have too many layers of pastel down and you can't do any more spraying a layer of that can kind of help give it a little bit more tooth and hold the pigment down so that you can do a final layer or two keep in mind it does darken your paper quite a bit um, that's often what I usually use it for is to darken layers so if I don't have a black that's dark enough which I found in the Derwent um, pastel set the pastel pencils their black in that set wasn't as dark as a lot of my other black pastel pencils and so what I ended up doing was spraying it with this workable fixative throughout the picture and it helped darken it up and making those values just a little bit darker now the the work the Derwent set has a lot of other really great darks it was just the black that I didn't find quite dark enough um, it was more like a like a really dark gunmetal color but just layering it up I'm kind of mixing some other colors in it to kind of play off the colors of the crocus so I added a little bit more of the like tealy green colors I've added some like navy blues and some purples just so the only purples aren't like just so the the only purples in the picture aren't just on the crocus I wanted there to be hints of it in this background even though the background is just kind of a wash of color. I will say I really like the Derwent white. Um, I've done some other tests on my whites and the only other white I found in my collection that was more white than this one was the Caran d'Ache titanium white pencil that I have. But the Derwent White was second most opaque and I really like using it and it really gave some really great highlights. And doing these highlights were where I realized I wanted this dark, this background to be a lot darker, not just like a mid-tone uh, blue color. I wanted it to be really dark and kind of dramatic lighting. But I'm again, I'm starting to refine a little bit how I've shaped the shadows and the highlights in this flower looking a little bit at that reference photo and starting to like have some of those lines stand out and I'm doing some line details that get blended in a little bit but you can always kind of see those lines I didn't want it to be too soft of a blend and that was to kind of mimic some of the veins and things like that you see in the petals of a flower uh, I wasn't going to do like all the super fine details that you see in the reference photo but I did want it to kind of 
show those veins and those lines that are very subtle in the reference photo. And again, I'm just using that rubber shaper and just pulling it in the, the, the blending tool in the direction that I want those lines to appear so that I can start building the shape. That's just an important trait anytime you're doing anything with blending. The direction you blend or the direction you lay down your color makes a big difference in how your picture looks in the long run. So if you are doing a, a tall field of grass and you want the grass close up to you to be drawn vertical and you want to blend it vertically because that's going to make it look taller visually. Grass in the distance in a far, far field, you're going to want to start drawing that a little bit more horizontally and blending it a little bit more horizontally because since it's far away, our brains kind of read it as flat. Um, if you're doing water and you want a calm ocean sunset picture, you want to draw your water horizontally and do your blending horizontally because if you start going up and down, it might make your water look a little fuzzy or make it look a little choppy and not like a calm, smooth night. So one of my favorite things about soft pastels and pastel pencils is the ability to blend. It is so blendable. You can almost blend things indefinitely. And it's something that's kind of hard to do with your colored pencils. With colored pencils, you either have to use some kind of solvent like um, Gamzol to break down the binders in the, the pigment to get it to flow a little bit more like paint and to blend on the paper or you have to layer your pencils very lightly and gradually so that you can get nice soft blends. With pastel pencils you can blend them either manually by layering them on your paper and then taking some kind of tool or something to blend them or you can blend them by how you layer. So just the act of laying down a color on top of another will cause those pigments to kind of shift and mix together. So both of them cause different effects and it just makes it really exciting to work with this medium. And I love it. I know some people prefer to be able to blend in a palette before they add it to the paper. But one thing you can do, if you don't know how your colors are gonna look next to each other or on top of each other or mixed together um, on a dry mediums like pencil or pastel pencils or things like that, you can have a test paper next to you and you can kind of layer them up to see how they will interact and look together. And that works with colored pencils or your pastels. Um, I have worked with enough colors and I'm familiar enough with color theory that that's something I don't do as much as I used to, but it is really helpful. And it's probably going to be something I do with some of my swatches that I keep in each tin. Um, I keep my pastels and art supplies organized by brand. That makes it easier for videos and things like that. Um, and so I keep color swatches and samples of those in each of the tins, just so I know what colors are in there and what I can expect. And sometimes some colors on the pencil look a little bit different than when they're applied to paper. But I think I'm going to just mix them together and mix some colors together and see what happens and kind of experiment that way. I do that a lot with watercolor. And I think it'd be interesting to do again with my pastels, especially since I've gotten a lot of new pastel pencils and I wanna see how they interact and work together. So I am still doing a lot of layering on this picture and it might be a little bit boring to watch and I am sorry, but I didn't want to edit it out too much because I wanted you to get an idea of 
how long it actually takes to achieve some of these highly detailed works. And this isn't even the most detailed of picture I've ever done. But it takes a long time to build these layers, even in a medium like pastel pencil where it's a little bit quicker than colored pencil, it still takes time. Now there's things I could have done that would have sped it up and some of them I mentioned earlier like doing an underpainting or going for a more loose style where I'm not adding as much details or things like that. And I probably would have been quicker if I had been painting with and drawing with pastels regularly before I did this. But it still takes a lot of time and I don't want people to feel discouraged because sometimes when you watch these videos, you can be like, man, they're going so fast because it's all sped up and you don't realize quite how long it actually took the artist to do that work. And you can feel like you're a failure or you're not a very good artist because you couldn't keep up or it took you a long time to do a piece. Um, this flower took me like two and a half hours to do. And part of that was because I was frustrated with the background and trying to get it to be dark enough and still be softly blended. Um, some of that was just because I wasn't feeling the need to rush, but it still took quite a bit of time and there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, I usually encourage people to take their time and in a lesson setting that can be really hard um, because if you're doing something like watercolor or oil paints or things like that, you have to wait for the medium to dry in between layers sometimes. And that adds time to how long you're working. And also the artist might be going faster than you because they've practiced that piece multiple times. So when I teach in person in live classes, I've practiced that picture probably two or three times before I go in to teach just to help make it a smoother process. So I automatically and instinctively know what I need to do and I don't have to stop and take a break and think about it. Where my students are listening to it from me for the first time and they're not as familiar with painting as I am and they haven't painted this picture multiple times to get used to it. So just something to keep in mind. And if you are trying to follow along with this and watch what I'm doing, feel free to pause it. Um, so, um, sometimes these types of tutorials that are sped up and mine are even kind of long for a lot of art videos, they can be hard to follow along with. And so I'm, I'm mostly just wanting you to kind of pick up techniques and tricks and stuff for you to apply to your pictures. But I am still just layering it up and you can see how much more detail has started to develop in this picture. And that just comes from the layers and refining and just taking a break, coming back to it and seeing what needs to be altered or changed. Um, I didn't want too much white to be on these highlights. I needed a little bit of variation. And so one thing I did was kind of feather in other colors onto the highlights. So it wasn't just this big blob of stark white. So I sometimes used a light blue to feather it. Sometimes I used like a pink to kind of darken the value just ever so subtly. And then again, doing the blending where I follow my blending in a specific, I do my blending in a specific uh, direction so that it fits the shape of each petal. One thing you can kind of see on this petal on the far left, um, kind of up on it, you can see some um, spot splotches on that. That is because I'm covering them up right now. Um, that is from blending it with a dirty tool. So I didn't, I blended a dark area and then I went up immediately and blended this area that was really light. And the color that was on that blending tool was dark and when I laid it down on that paper it left a, a, a dark mark and I usually keep like a an old rag or something next to me to wipe them off or if I'm using traditional pastels I have an old rag to kind of wipe off any dark marks that are on my pastels just so I don't get goobers like that on my picture so I sprayed my picture again to make it dark and again I'm just trying to layer this up and add some drama 
to the picture. Um, you can see there's some spots on the flower petal from where the, the spray dripped. I probably should have moved the picture and held it vertically so my spray can was vertical as well. That way I wouldn't get the, that splashiness. Um, but I'm just going to do a layer of pastel over it to kind of cover it. But again, I'm just layering up these dark pastels and then I got smart and I started blending them with some of these like soft tools I have and it still lightens it up a little bit, but not nearly as much as the soft tools. Those sponges can sometimes just pick up way too much color. So something I wanted to talk on in this picture was talking about color matching and color theory and value and things like that. Because there's a lot of these colors in this picture that I don't have the exact color for in this pastel set. Um, or in any of my pastel sets if I was going to like dig through all of them. And with color pencils and things like that, these dry mediums, since you can't custom mix a color, you have to get creative with how you layer them. But even with the best of layering, you might not get the exact picture or color that you see in your picture. And that's okay. The most important thing you can do is get close and try to match the value because your value is going to make the biggest difference in how something looks, if it looks dimensional, if it looks like the right shape, all those things. So if you are wondering if something is dark or light enough, take your reference photo, make it black and white, and then take a picture of your, your drawing or your painting and make that black and white and kind of compare the two. That way you can know if your darks are dark enough or your lights are light enough and your midtones are balanced in the correct way. And that can give you a good guide on what you need to do or change in your picture. I also wanted to talk about this because it's really easy to be working on a picture and think, oh, if only I had this color, maybe I need to go out and buy more. And sometimes that's true, um, but it can be a really big trap to fall in. And I would rather you be able to use what you have and make the most of it than try and buy every supply out there and never use it. Because the biggest waste of art supplies are the ones that are never used. So mix your colors, experiment, because that's where you're going to be learning a ton. And if you do feel like buying some new colors to add to your collection, that's fine. But don't feel pressured into thinking that the only way you're going to become a better artist or a good artist is by having lots of supplies because that's not true. Sometimes giving yourself some kind of limitation forces you to become more creative and forces you to become a better artist. And that's part of why I was so strict on this picture by only using the Derwent pastels and I wasn't going to use any of my other blending techniques for this particular piece because I wanted to kind of push myself and work in a way that I don't typically work and see what I can achieve with it. And you can see I'm doing a lot of like layering of like hot pink magentas and whites and trying to get these like veins kind of showing through. And we're getting to the point in the picture where I'm not looking at the reference photo quite as much and I'm looking more at what the picture needs. There's going to be a point in every picture that you create where you need to stop looking at your reference photo and look at what your individual picture needs. Because you can see there's differences between my sketch and the reference photo. The petals aren't exactly the same shape or dimensions. There's a lot of mistakes on it. So I need to, I can still use my reference photo as a guide, but I don't want to just put all my effort and energy into making this sketch look exactly like the reference photo, an exact copy. And that's probably why I like working in like flowers or more organic things like trees, leaves, um, pet portraits and things like that, because not everything's going to look exactly the same. So you don't have to be super duper exact with how you draw it. You just need to get it close. Animals um, can be a little bit trickier, and humans, if you don't get your proportions right and things like that, it could really 
look wrong. But I found that landscapes and organic things like flowers and leaves and plants and trees and stuff like that, if there's a little bit of variation, no one's going to know. It's like that TikTok um, sound, the sound that everyone uses. No one's going to know. No one's going to know. Um, you can just kind of make it do and adjust it to how you need it to look. It's interesting to see just how this has changed in the last five minutes with this background becoming darker. Um, really pushing those really dark values in the background has really allowed this flower to come forward and those highlights from the backlighting to that are along the side of the flower to really start to pop and stand out a little bit more. And I'm just layering up these pinks to help create some of that magenta color that you see in the reference photo and help soften up some of those white highlights that I did because there's this glowing white showing through the flowers, but I don't want it to be too bright or too all one value because then I'll lose the dimension and the shape of the flower. And we are reaching the point in this picture where I am starting to do just the final details, looking at what the picture needs individually, taking a break, coming back to it. There were several times where I thought I was like almost done with the picture and then I'd go do something else and come back to it and be like, oh, nope, I'm not done yet. But I also had a lot of fun with this picture because I was able to just kind of get in the, the, in the mode or the, the groove of it and wasn't too highly focused on other things in my life. Um, like I had said, I took most of the summer off and was just kind of getting back into art. And this was one of those first pictures um, coming back into. I had done just a handful before this one. And kind of the hard, like rough patch of like getting back into it had kind of worn off. And I was able to just kind of groove to it, listen to my music and listen to my book and just be in the art mode or in the zone and kind of forget about everything else and just decide what the picture needs and create it. And that was a really nice place to be in this picture. Um, and that's one of my favorite things to do in art is when you get kind of in this art zone and you're not stressed about wor the world or your family or anything like that and you can just be one with the art supplies if that is corny enough for you <laughs> but it's true just me and my art supplies and my music or my book or even just a quiet house sometimes is all I need to kind of reset my mood and get me back in a happy healthier place and I hope art becomes that for you it can be frustrating when art isn't going the way we want but it can be a really great escape to kind of help us cope with some of the weight of the world and you can see I've added a little bit of green just kind of playing up with some other colors in it I added some to the background and I added some to the flower and I decided I was done. And I am just going over the my signature just to make it stand out a little bit more. Sometimes I'll do like a cast shadow on my signature to just help it pop. But I hope you found this tutorial helpful-ish. I don't know if it was really a tutorial or a demo or just a random chat. But I hope you found it helpful and you learned some things about art and pastel pencils. And I hope you have a fantastic day. And I will see you next time.